Okay, so we submitted a book proposal with the title Coded Power um, that, that will develop the themes that I'm introducing here. So, you know, stay tuned is all I um, can say. I will not give everything away. Of course, I can't because I'm trying to sell the book at this at this moment. But uh, but here's what we want to do. Can you ha can I have the next slide? Okay, so so just let me give you the core argument, which is that data dominion is not about privacy, but about social control. So I think we're just on the wrong path from a legal perspective of on the governance perspective to try to manage the the, the, the problem at the heart of, of, of digital control by focusing on individual privacy. Um, uh, data dominion operates through channels beyond the control of individual data subjects um, and has effects on social outcomes that are difficult to predict and difficult to control. We've seen the divisiveness, we've seen the erosion of social cohesion, and we, we've seen the, under, um, the, 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 the extent to which uh, the production and maintenance of social norms is being undermined and, of course, other traits that are part of social interactions and individual uh, characteristics, of course, uh, but 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 are reinforced. And that's mostly, um, you know, hate and, and divisiveness, etc. But also, um, of course, the, the data dominion can be used uh, for exploitative purposes. And I come back to that in a second. Uh, the, the legal framework that we're using is is inept, it's outdated. It comes from ideas about um, individual freedom that might be developed, might have been developed in the Enlightenment or the idea of, of Warren and Brandeis at the end of the 19th century that we have a right to be left alone. That's fine, but it does not capture in any way, I think, what's happening right now in, in the world of data uh, dominion. And that, in, in other words, privacy, the concept of privacy understates the nature of the problem, which is really total control of, of social relations. Next slide, please. Can I have the next slide? Doesn't work, let me try this. Can I do it? Okay. I've so changed. I think okay. Thank you. Okay, okay. then I can. perfect. Um, so, so what is data dominion? Um, first of all, data is um, in information theory is is defined as information on a device. So it's really all about information. Um, it is, of course, I, I don't want to overstate what I'm saying on this slide. It is, of course, also about our individual personalities, but it's also about us as types because um, it's all about generalization and scale and the aggregation of information about us. Some things, of course, are being fed back directly to individuals as well. So I don't want to you know, understate that threat either. But I think the, the core of what's happening with big tech in particular, but also um, with state surveillance is to find uh, types rather than individuals. Um, it is about representation representativeness, not necessarily idiosyncratic traits. It is about, about mani manipulation through psychology rather than force. So our entire concepts about what state power is and how to guard against state power has to be rethought and also has to be extended to the private realm and it's highly clandestine or not open, therefore difficult to control. I think many of our governance mechanisms don't really work. And the politics of data dominion play into the hands of, of the controllers. Once there is scale, they can also help manipulate the processes by which we decide um, 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 how to deal with these issues. And so we are in this, in this cycle of not getting, uh, which makes it hard to get out of. I've in introduced some uh, some artwork of my, my my late sister because she was uh, one of her big topics were labyrinths and I just felt sort of we are sort of stuck in this labyrinth, but we can also sort of you know when we want to see uh, um, structures about um, what's happening, um, I think her her work is also invocative at least uh, in my mind of sort of forcing us to look through the first um, picture and 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 look at the deeper structure of what's going on in the world. Um, I've sort of tried to, and this that's sort of, you know, it's nice when you have a sabbatical, you just read via uh, very widely. And I've just tried to to think again about power and control and how to think about this in this particular domain to sharpen my analytical skills. And, and one of the books I came across was by James Benninger, um, who talked about control and, uh, and and basically said it's increasing the capability to process information. In the old day, I think it was really mostly about bureaucratization. It then became more about computerization, but I think we're now beyond that. 
um, he suggests very often about decreasing the amount of information to be processed. And of course, that was in the world before we had the computational power that we have today. So it was about rationalization and streamlining certain types of information and sometimes even the destruction or the ignoring of information. And yet, of course, our com contemporary information technology with the computational power that we have allows us to process a much larger amount of, of data in, in zero time. Also, our storage capacity for data has increased tremendously and the ability to combine and link different data sets and then there, thereby um, sort of find um, uh, information about entire groups of people or even individually trace them back, even if we don't use personal information, for example, trace them back to and, and knowing who they are is sort of a, a, a capacity that we have today with information technology that um, goes way beyond, I think, what Benninger um, anticipated uh, in 1986. Um, power, of course, is, as Dahl famously put it, uh, is to get someone to do something that he or she would not otherwise do. And you can do this through many different means. So you force somebody to take a turn um, where she or he um, uh, did not really want to take a turn at that um, at that time. And this can, of course, happen in very insidious ways. It's not just putting a gun to your head, as Hannah Arendt famously said, you, know, you can't hold an entire people at gunpoint, right? But you can manipulate them in ways that they will be very likely to do what you want them to do um, by uh, more uh, psychological uh, means. Um, another literature I've sort of delved into is a structura a structuration by Giddens, of course, um, who defines structuration as the transformative capacity of human action um, that will derive in the main form from this ability of agents to harness structures to their project. So it's not only sort of you giving an order, but you're creating structures and you control parts of these structures and through these structures to control what's happening in the world. Um, one of these structures that he discussed is language. And of course, computer language is also a certain type of language, right? The, the binary, binary variables that we're using. So, so language, syntax, and rules of grammar are um, structures in, in social life. So is status, nationalism, and citizenship. And I think the digital age is very much about identities, individual identities, group identities, their preferences, their sentiments that are being um, used and, and reinforced by writing algorithms that that you know go um, help certain messages go viral or that that trace uh, certain types of um, uh, people. And, and, and their, their behavior. Another concept I found um, really helpful to think about, although I think in the original statement it was kind of limiting, is, is, is Michael Mann's idea of infrastructural power. He used it, of course, to uh, to compare different states or different polities um, and, 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 and see how states control their people. And he talked about despotic power, but also infrastructural power. And for him, infrastructural power was the capacity of the state to actually penetrate civil society. Uh, through literacy. So if we go back to the 19th century and, and beyond, um, um, sort of national literacy is, uh, was achieved then and, and having a standardized language, so we're going back to Giddens, of course, um, was helpful. Uh, creating coinage weights measures is another way of, of creating infrastructure power. Transport and communication infrastructures go beyond that. I would say the legal system, of course, is also part of this infrastructure power. Um, ben Benjamin Brown recently has um, used the same concept in a very different uh, way, which I also find uh, quite um, um, uh, interesting. Uh, he basically says infrastructural ent entanglements, as he says, is a two-way relationship, let's say, between um, actors in the financial market and the state, because the extent to which central banks today use market mechanism to influence monetary policy also forces them to go on the terrain of the markets and play by the logic of the markets. And that gives market actors powers over the central banks in ways that they didn't have before. So this creates an infrastructural entanglement, again, from which the central banks can't really free themselves because if they want to make sure that the that they that they can stabilize financial markets in times of crisis, they have to use these means now. Otherwise, they, they're not meeting the expectations <clears throat> of the markets and they could crash, which is why they're playing the game. Yet another way to think about this was by, by Pinzor, who used it to explain um, the emergence of um, commodities markets in the 19th century. And, and, and the, the specific, specifics may be less interesting than the way that he talks about it when, when he says it's, it's about integrating relations <clears throat> and coordinating practices across technical organizational and socially components that might be that might not have been uh, brought together before. So the, the, the point here is really infrastructural power sort of creates synergies or 
combines different aspects of lives in ways that um, that had not existed before. In his example, it was uh, a commodities exchange and, and the telegraph, new information systems and the commodities exchange completely changed the way we, we, these markets were organized. And I think one of the important aspects here is that this, this recreation or this creation of synergies across different domains uh, transcends very often the existing boundaries for governance, whether it's state governance or even contractual governance. Or, so we can use, we use of very often conventional means, but we're creating a sort of new, new types of structures that are difficult to then, you know, govern from above. The, the big question about governance is, of course, always who governs the governors and the extent to which you can break out existing schemes of governance um, uh, makes it possible for people to build basically new power centers that are not subject to the same kinds of control mechanisms that we have subjected states to and that we think states can control privates. But if privates can evade this and even states through their state surveillance programs can evade this, then who governs? The governors comes back as the key question, of course. Um, <clears throat> I, I have to watch a little bit the time, so I will um, uh, go a little faster. Um, um, so another co concept would be uh, Foucault's. I will not um, spend too much time here. He, he has this idea, of course, of the capillary structures um, of, 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 of power. So the, we, this is, again, sort of penetrating society through ways that are less um, visible than the typical power uh, structures that, that we have in mind when we think about how to control this by legal means, etc. So for, for, for data, um, I, I think we have to then sort of step back from we're, we're looking at all these theories about power and control. And then for the world of data, we have to step back and think about what are the core elements that make data such a powerful tool uh, to dominate over others, a, a tool of, of dominion, really. And, um, and at least three concepts have been discussed in the information uh, theory literature, and, and one can expand on those. One is storage communication and interpretation. And then I think you can add manipulation, especially in our age where we have these feedback loops um, uh, uh, that, um, that can be used to influence others, not only observe them. So storage, um, uh, you know, I, I won't have time to go through this, but we know, I mean, some of us are old enough to remember the old big floppy disks <laughs> that we used to store our data. There was a time when we actually had full control over the information that we processed on computers because we stored them on devices that we physically controlled. And of course, this went out of the you know, this, this just went away with the cloud. But there was a time when we had personal computers and we had our information stored on personal computers and it was then difficult to transfer this to another device, but we did have full control over this and that 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 is no longer the case because we're all sort of using uh, these uh, um, uh, cloud devices. Um, one big question, of course, um, uh, that uh, is an, an interesting legal question is always, and whose data is it really, right? As long as we stored it on a device, you know, if somebody just stole my floppy disk, then that person stole my floppy disk. This was a theft. If they now scrape my data when I use the cloud, what is that? Yeah, yeah. And um, and what is interesting is again, it's, I think we are we are invoking old legal concepts to deal with something that is really completely different, and therefore, therefore evades um, the control structures that we have. So if it just go back to first principles again we, we, we basically ask ourselves what is you know what kind of property rights do exist or rights to something exist and the Romans basically had three categories one was res communis something that belonged to all the air the rivers um, uh, the, the the beaches they thought <laughs> we of course have privatized much more but so the, the, the stuff that belongs to all and the important point is these things may not be appropriated now, how to govern against that is a different question, but the idea was this cannot be expropriated. And we sometimes restate this idea by saying you can't you can't privatize the out, outer space, which of course is happening nonetheless, but the idea there is convention, international convention that says you can't touch that, right? Or the, the seas, the open seas, et cetera. Now, everything, of course, in the, in the world of global capitalism is challenged on those um, measures, but conceptually, I think it's interesting to think about something that shall not be appropriated, then there's res nullius that does not belong to anybody yet, but can be captured. And then, of course, there are, there are things that have already been allocated. These are typically private private goods or private property rights. I think our data are being used as are being treated by the big tech companies in the state as res nullius. They don't belong to anybody until they have been captured. Once they have been captured and put on a device, they belong to somebody. Um, so 
courts in the US in particular, but elsewhere as well, have said data producers do not have property rights to their data because they're not of no economic value to them. It's also an interesting way to define what property rights mean. They're vested with companies that have improved. This is the old Lockean idea. We have improved um, the data by cleaning them, organizing them, and then putting them on a physical device. Now they have captured them. And access to digital platforms is then conditioned on formal consent to data harvesting. So we're giving them the, the opportunity to harvest even even more data. Um, and so I think, again, sort of our basic ideas of how to create property rights can be abused um, easily in, the, in this particular context. Um, and of course, we have legislation that backs this. There's the, the 1986 US Computer Anti-Fraud Act, which says that device owners have control and property rights over the data. If anybody hacks into them, that person commits a theft, thereby implicitly accepting that property rights belong to those who have put data on, on, it, on, it, on, it, on a device. Um, the, the alternative that legislators have come up with and have debated since the 1960s in the United States is to say we use privacy. We don't use property rights, but we use privacy. And that, of course, reduces the entire problem to one of individuals wanting to be left alone rather than conceptualizing this as, 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 an, as, an, as a matter of power. Because property rights, I think, even in the legal discourse, everybody would um, uh, concede that this has to do with power, right? It's your, it's maybe not imperium, but it's dominium. And so, so you control your, your, your assets and you can exclude others from them it's it's a power thing and privacy is you know it's also of course you can say it's a kind of a pie of, of, of also a power thing but but it's it's sort of conceptualized as something that is mostly about our our um, uh, our um, idea of being being left left alone um, and and so we we then create legislation around this particular idea and I think we are wanting on the question of power in um, let me just come back sort of to these three ideas of information the um, theory. You have storage, you have communication, and you have interpretation. Um, communication um, uh, is, of course, relational, and uh, uh, Sal Salome Bijoin and others have, have also you know, made very powerful arguments that data is not about individual control. It is about social relations as well. Um, uh, and uh, one of the you know, fascinating things is when you trace the development of technology in this domain, you can also see how in computer technology decisions have been made that have made it uh, far easier for some to control the relations amongst others while depriving us of our own ability to trace where certain contributions came from. And one example is the, uh, the decision for um, hypertext to have one way and unidirectional linking rather than two way linking, which would have allowed us to you know, make, make sure that everybody who makes a contribution to something will be recognized and attributed somehow um, rather than having only one way uh, linking. There were big debates about this in the computer um, world, um, but for, for a number of reasons, um, they went one particular way. And I think, uh, it, could we reverse this? I think we might, might even be in a better world uh, today as well. So I won't go much into the technology because I'm, I'm the lawyer here. My co-author will do the technology stuff, but I, I just um, wanted to give you a sense of the scope of the project that we are working with. And here are some just ideas about the evolution in the computer technology world as well. Um, what the one point I just want to make is, is this is you know this ha didn't happen by grand design. This is not like creationism. Somebody sat down and then create this big, uh, you know, Benthamian panopticon where we observe everybody from a central point of view. The 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 way in which sort of the data control or data dominion has evolved over the last couple of decades was by a series of rather discrete decisions that have, of course, a, a certain logic for state survey, surveillance or certain logic for capitalist exploitation of a new asset type, namely data. But it's not, it wasn't basically a, a big conspiracy theory or a big um, a thing by design, but it happens through certain discrete decisions. Understanding what decisions were made and what implications they had might help us in the future to guard against that. But of course, we have to think again, sort of then, you know, how to vest power with some to make it less possible that this is happening uh, again. But I think understanding sort of this decentralized way in which power is built is critical. And for those of you who have read my Code of Capital, that's of course my core argument. You can use a certain type of law that is available for self-governance, but you can use this to build power and use that power also against the state and thereby defend your power against um, um, sort of the le Leviathan that otherwise should uh, be able to con con control you. And something similar, maybe more, even more powerful is happening in this digital world. So I'm going to skip this. This is again like just looking at the history 
of what happened, how um, the, the the technology was built, what critical decisions were made, and who was in the driver's seat when they were made. Um, so, so um, there were battles for control. I mean, clearly, people debated these different things, and and I think the the the, the big thing really happened, of course, when we when we go to the birth of the cloud. Amazon launches the web service then in the early 2000s. That's basically when we when we when we lost um, control. Um, over over our own uh, data in a big way. Um, I will skip this as well because this is basically just ideas about play, um, explaining patterns of technological change and thinking about how this relates to social change, including institutional and legal um, change. Um, what I want to uh, um, uh, hone in on in the last couple of minutes um, of my presentation is to think about the political economy of technological and legal change. Um, so I think the technological evolution, of course, happens in the context of a, of a capitalist system. It was driven very much in the United States, although there were, of course, developments <clears throat> in Europe um, uh, or Japan in, in East Asia um, as well. And this, of course, capitalism is a system that is, um, is always on the search for new types of assets to extract surplus from. It's very expensive, um, and expansion doesn't mean just ge geographical, but of course, finding new types of asset classes. And data is really, uh, of course, uh, fantastic because it's it's just boundless, right? It is infinite in a way. Instead of how how to use data in ways that you can sort of extract additional resources from, is the the big question. But there are so many different variations that it seems. To to be one of these magic resources people had, you know, thought of, you know, going back to the alchemists in the, in the Middle Ages, you know, can you can you make your own gold? Uh, so we're con constantly producing data that others can use in ways that we have no idea about. Um, uh, and of course, it's always the question is always not just to uh, control. It's also about extracting pecuniary value. Um, you, you, you create property rights to monetize, um, not necessarily to invent or to, 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 to have a piece of land. Um, and um, uh, uh, and of course, this also means that there's a heavy selection bias into the system. Those who have the resources to use the technologies or build new technologies, they have a first mover advantages. Um, uh, so these are typically states. We know that the internet was developed by the military. Uh, large corporations have a chance, but, and that's maybe where some hope comes in, there are a lot of small um, technologists um, that, have, that develop new ideas, and, and I think there are frontiers, so we both believe that there are frontiers in technological developments that one could use to also um, um, uh, uh, try to stem the system or maybe nudge it into a different direction. I don't want to overstate, overclaim here. I'm not a, a you know, I don't think there's sort of a single, you know, silver bullet solution, but I just think there's some hope in technology as well. Um, one thing we should also keep in mind is that, um, you know, the, the, the idea that we could just sort of sit down and regulate and, and find a good legislative solution is at best naive. Um, I, I would say it basically has failed, certainly in the United States. So in, I think from the European perspective, there's always the, the idea that in the US, they just didn't do anything about uh, data privacy, but the Europeans finally did. But um, uh, Priscilla Regan wrote a very nice book already in the 1990s, looking at privacy legislation in Congress and showing that there were over there were hundreds, 260 bills alone between 1960 and 1972, very early, that dealt um, uh, with questions of privacy. Only two acts were passed, and of course they they dealt with crime and credit reporting, things that sort of galvanize people, and 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 make it more likely that things will pass. Uh, communication privacy issues. There were 80 on congressional hearings um, in over th uh, three decades, hundreds of hours in staff time, pages of staff reports. And finally, after decades and decades and decades, we get the 1986 Communication Privacy Act that was probably one of the most successful um, uh, um, uh, legislations. And it worked only because there was, for this particular matter, an alignment between private industry and advocates of privacy. If you don't get this alignment, you don't pass anything. So, you know, legislators just not the state from the top doing something correcting what we do as privates but of course it's highly contested and, and will be blocked if it doesn't um, find enough support and uh, what we what our strategy is and then then i will stop our our strategy is to think about technological advances 
and then the law will follow. So basically thinking about how can we vest <clears throat> control over data back with the individuals and not only for privacy issues, but for individuals so that they can make decisions on their own, but also get together with others and jointly collect, um, jo jointly control how data can, can be used. Um, so we believe, and I have to take Kopia's word for that, that there's the technology, the technologically ad advances that make this possible in principle. Um, storage of data is key and having access to stored data is key, but one good news here is that 90% of all the data that's currently stored has been collected only over the past three years, and that this has been true for about 30 years. Which means that if you can stop the, con the storage of data and the collection of data in the future, you might have a chance, right? It's not sort of something where the big behemoths have control forever, but only as long as we let them. Um, and, and of course, we have to make sure that we create governance systems that work both in technology and in, in law. These are just some of the technological devices. I will skip this in, in the interest of time. Um, this is basically a system that uh, Copia has um, designed himself, basically in a kind of a platform where you would, or with a group of people, of course, you don't do this on your own, um, but where data creators can come to, so this is you and I, can come together and join a platform, pool their data, and make collective decisions about who may may have access to the data to you to to run certain uh, processes on um, but this will be pre-decided pre and and so you give um, uh, producers an opportunity to say my data can be used for certain types of purposes in advance it's sticky can't be easily changed and then but people can still use it without identifying the individual users but they can run um, algorithms if it fits the criteria that have been established up front there are of course lots of you know details that um, are are important and, and and governance questions that have been have to be discussed and then <clears throat> let me just whoops yeah so i'm just gonna um uh end and with this basically saying there is you know i think the where i see some hope is that there is uh, a lot of power in the digital coding that could be used in ways that are different from how the big um, tech companies are currently doing that. Um, um, of course, we have to think about how to make switching very easy and attractive for individual users. Without the agency of individuals, this will not work. Um, in principle, my, my, my reading of how the law works, the law typically um, uh, sanctions um, uh, rights exposed doesn't create new ones if sanctions them exposed. So if there's enough, enough pressure or if enough con control has already established, there's a great likelihood that the law will um, uh, recognize and, and vindicate uh, those particular rights. And so I think a move in technology might be helpful. And then of course you have to, to, to think about how to make sure that the law also then um, uses categories and develops new categories to protect them adequately.